Oliver Delft took his pulse while running on the spot. Ninety-eight. Not bad. He blew out five or six times and looked round the square, allowing his breathing to settle into a calmer rhythm. He did not like his wife to see him even slightly out of breath, so as a rule he would stay on the doorstep until he was able to go back into the house, presenting the appearance of a man who has done no more than walk to the post-box and back. Light was leaking into the sky from the east. Through the trees he could see that one or two of the Balkan embassies had their lights on. On a number of occasions in the past he had surprised his staff by warning them of impending crises simply on the basis of his observations of ambassadorial windows, an irony that pleased him in this so-called digital age. Oliver frowned suddenly. A car was parked in the bay next to his, a silver Lexus that did not bear diplomatic plates. He could see the broad silhouette of an enormously fat driver sitting at the wheel. He made a note of the number and fished for his latchkey. The first sign that alerted him to something strange afoot in the house was the sound of the children's laughter. Oliver's brood were never merry at the breakfast table. They slouched over their cereal, sulkily reading the packets or groaning for the radio to be turned off in favour of the television. The second sign of unusual goings-on was the smell of bacon hanging in the hallway. Oliver was following a strict low-fat diet, and Julia had been a vegetarian all her life. The children, although the youngest was now thirteen, were still addicted to Cocoa Pops and Frosties. Oliver heard a man's voice as he approached the kitchen. Bugger, he thought to himself, Uncle Bloody Jimmy. Julia's brother Jimmy was a favourite with the children, but, as so often with those that children take to, adults found him a complete bore. The time would fit, Oliver realised, glancing at his watch. Uncle Jimmy often dropped by early in the morning, after his flight from America had landed and he had a few hours to fill before the business world woke up. At least his arrival cleared up the mystery of the Lexus and chauffeur parked outside. Oliver prepared a welcoming face and opened the kitchen door. If he had been asked to compile a list of a thousand people he might expect to see sitting at his kitchen table performing magic tricks for the benefit of his family, the dot-com billionaire Simon Cotter would not have featured anywhere. "'There you are, darling,' said his wife. Cotter looked up and smiled. "'Good morning, Sir Oliver. You must excuse me for barging in on your family like this, so early, too. I was passing on my way to the airport and took a chance on your being in. Been for a run?' Oliver, acutely aware of his tracksuit and headband, and for no good reason embarrassed by them, nodded. "'It's a great pleasure to see you, Mr. Cotter, if you'll let me shoot upstairs and change.' "'Come on, Simon, where is it?' India, the youngest, had grabbed Simon's hand and was feeling up his sleeve and tugging at his beard. "'Ah, now, where would you like it to be? Would you like it to be under the sugar bowl, perhaps? In the toast rack? Inside the newspaper?' "'Under the sugar bowl. "'Well, then, have a look. "'Bloody hell!' "'Oliver was amazed to see that Rupert, "'back from Oxford and tiresomely sophisticated these days, "'was as wide-eyed and wriggling as the others. "'Another! Do another!' "'By the time Oliver came downstairs again, "'they were in the middle of a mind-reading trick. "'Even Oliver's mother, sitting slightly apart in her wheelchair, "'appeared to be enjoying herself, "'if the quantity of dribble sliding from the corners of her mouth "'could be regarded as a reliable index.' Julia, the children, and Maria had all drawn shapes on pieces of paper and were clustered around Cotter, who put a finger dramatically to each temple and stared downwards with a great frown. "'The great Cottini must think! He must think! Ay, no desme la lata!' he muttered to himself. Oliver was surprised to see Maria giggle. She said something in Spanish, and Cotter replied fluently. "'My spirit guide, he has advised me,' he announced, after turning his face in turn to each of the giggling, hot-faced children. "'Olivia, because she is very clever and very beautiful, she would be choosing a fine horse, yes? You have drawn a horse, I am fancying.' Olivia unfolded her piece of paper to reveal a competently drawn horse. "'It's a pony, actually,' she said. Cotter slapped his forehead. "'Ach, I am so stupid! Of course it is a pony, not horse! Pony! Forgive me, child, my powers are weak in the mornings. Let me consider now Julia. Julia will choose, I think, an apple. Yes, of this I am quite sure, an apple, half eaten.' 